Got it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to broadcast right now so that I can get us. Take the poll down. Right on YouTube. Yeah, shut the poll. The poll is. You lost your screen. Yeah, I have to stop sharing for a second. Um, you should not see my screen right now, right? Right. You see five of us on screen. Sweet. And we're recording. I see that in the upper left. Yeah. I'm just going out to YouTube really quickly. Maddie, what's on the wall behind you? Uh, what's on the wall behind me? There's a picture. Do you not like Thank it? You. No, I didn't know what it was. I thought you were going to tell me what was in the picture. Oh, no, it's just a pretty picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's some people dancing, uh, and there's a sun with a bird in the sun. I think it's some famous uh, artist, but I don't know who it is. Okay. Like Matisse or Manet or one of those guys. Got it. Sorry, Miss Ignorant here. Five three zero nine four five five three zero. It says your poll is still on, Lee Meng. I think I just saw a chat and thing that said that. Give me a second. Want me to exit out, or I won't touch anything. Thank you. It's no longer polling, and right now I just need to make sure. Okay. Oh, Andrea, the. Uh, the uh, YouTube requires a verification, which I'm not sure we're verified, so. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah, well, you, you can't live stream until you're logged into the real thing, and you can't real thing it until, anyways. I think we're- People are showing, um, we're halfway. Yep, yep. Oh, we just lost somebody. Hello, everyone. We're going to give it a few minutes. Knock, knock. <laughs> All right. I think we are just a minute away. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Artie. Okay. Artie who? <laughs> Artie Chen. Hi, Nicole. Okay, <laughs> great. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Okay, guys. Welcome. Hi, everyone. It's just about one o'clock. Thank you for very much for being on time. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes as people stream in. Uh, welcome to Master the World. I am Lee Ming Stro, the co-founder and CEO of Master the World, MTW. This is our second webinar, so we thank you very much for joining us. We know you have options. Gosh, there are so many webinars out there. So if we are your second, third, fourth webinar for the day, thank you for being here uh, wherever you are. Uh, our story, how we started Master the World, I'm not going to go into it this time around. Uh, we talked about it last time, but I definitely encourage you, if this is your first webinar with us, to check out mtwwines.com. To kick things off, I am going to introduce our panelists. I'm going to start off with Evan. Evan, uh, I'll take my screen off and I'll put it back on. Evan, if you want to say a few words. Yeah, sure. Um, happy to have all of you here with us, uh, with Li Meng. Uh, I co-founded the company. This is our, uh, literally, it took us about five plus years from idea to activation, but it's a joy uh, to have you all with us and a joy to participate in something which we hope is uh, beneficial uh, for people out there, both uh, consumers as well as uh, Jedi Knights in training, and a uh, treat to be with you all this afternoon. And then we have Tim Gazer, who is joining us from... Uh, New Mexico. Tim, do you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Uh, welcome from uh, behind the Adobe curtain, you know, <laughs> and uh, looking forward to the tasting. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Then we have Madeline Trafon, Master Sommelier, who is in Michigan. Hi, Maddie. Hi, everybody. It's um, a delight to be here. Thank you for having me, uh, Li Meng and Evan. Um, uh, Proud to be your colleague and friend, 
And I'm very much looking forward to this because, you know, go Jedi's in training. There's no reason you can't be better than we are. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we have a very full agenda. And unlike last time, we're going to try very best to stay within um, the 90 minutes allotted. So I'm going to share my screen so that we have our presentation up. There we go. All right. So um, I'm not sure why I have an echo now. Uh, I'm sorry. So today, um, our website is on here, mtwwines.com. I just want to go through some logistics very quickly. If you are tasting along, the kit that we're tasting is kit 106A. Uh, if you feel that this webinar is going really fast, this is not the webinar where you taste necessarily along. You should have already tasted, evaluated. You may not have revealed yet, and that's okay. But this is the process where we talk about uh, what we saw in the glasses. So if you feel like it's going really fast, hopefully you got the reminder that you should have tasted the wines. If you are not tasting along, please don't feel left out. Um, Evan and I, when we started this company, wanted to make sure that this wasn't um, a situation where you couldn't get a free account. You can always get a free account at mastertheworldmtwwines.com. If your buddy is tasting and you want to taste along with them, you can always get an account to taste along. If you're not tasting along, don't have wines in front of you, don't worry. Our goal is to talk about the wine markers, the benchmark, the things that we're looking for, so you can actually guess. And in theory, you could be listening to the descriptors that our master sommeliers are talking about and be able to guess and try to figure out what you're benchmarking. So if you are following along, um, I'll, again, it's 106A. And just one big shout out to all our subscribers. We are doing a webinar with each kit. Thank you so much for that suggestion. We're, we're definitely going to do it. So for those of you who are worrying that we won't do it, we are going to do that. An extra special thanks to Indiegogo. Evan and I launched the Indiegogo campaign in October of 2018, and we didn't ship till January of 2020. So we just want to say big shout out. Thank you to those who stuck by us as we fine tune our kit concept. Um, and we hope that you're enjoying kit number four. Um, five ways to stay engaged. Number one, if you haven't already joined the leaderboard, even if you've already tasted, you can join with the code CW72. This sort of puts your score against other people who've joined the same leaderboard. We have a Q&A. Uh, it's anonymous, or you could share your name, who you are, where you're at. Uh, and we're all here to learn. As Madeline likes to remind me, there are no dumb questions. So please um, fire them away. Anything we don't answer live, we will answer offline. So don't worry, there will be a recording, there will be answers for sure. Uh, if you see me glossing over some of the more generic questions, um, there might be questions that take more time, how to study, how to do this, fire them away. We might save those for the after webinar uh, Q&A part um, versus the ones that really pertain to these wines specifically. The third point is about chat. If you are chatting with us, um, Zoom kind of defaults to send to panelists as opposed to send to panelists and everyone. So make sure that you're clicking for that drop down so that everybody can see your comments. Um, unless of course you have something specific for just the panelists. Um, we will have a poll today. It's a fun addition. And I do talk very fast, if you haven't already figured that out. And so if I'm going too fast, you can always ask me to slow down. Go ahead and tell me on chat or Q&A. And upon exit, we hope that you can just answer some questions for a survey. Uh, for us here at Master the World, we learn by our community. And so we are always up for feedback, good or bad. Um, I personally enjoy answering emails. If I'm slow, that's just because of the backlog. But I, I really do see all emails that come through our customer service, som at mtwwines.com. So please keep those comments coming. Okay, so to see the kit, you if you want to see your own kit, you should log in at the website mtwwines.com and type 106A and under the taste and reveal, which looks something like this, that would be a kit number uh, that you enter here and we're in the full workout mode.
And if you're in, this is the screen that you will be seeing. Hopefully you filled out your wines. Uh, you can see here that I'm on kit 106A and webinar uh, one. And without further ado, I'm gonna kick off with the very first wine, Evan Goldstein, please. Yeah, thank you, Li Meng. You like answering all those emails? Boy, I get overwhelmed by it. <laughs> Somebody likes uh, doing that. I've been trying to figure out uh, how we can do less. Um, we're gonna go through, and as Li Meng said, the whole goal here is not so much for you to taste along the way, because you'll be drinking water literally out of a proverbial fire hose, but we're gonna talk a little bit about the findings of the wine, and then speak a, a little bit um, about uh, what highlighted, what, what, what stood out to, to at least to myself as I was, uh, as tasting the wine. Um, we'll do this quick little poll, sort of get a sense of what y'all thought it was. Even if you know what it was, maybe you can tell us what you thought it was before, et cetera. And then we'll reveal it and talk a little bit about uh, it specifically. And then we'll do that repeat, repeat it over um, five times. So what you'll notice here is that as you go down, um, we have sight, aroma, and taste, structure, and your deduction. So it's important as you go through that you filled out all of these. Um, if one was taking a test, we would uh, feed back and tell you if you didn't fill out your grid in your brain, if you didn't fill out your boxes, you can't possibly score all the points. So as you've gone through this, make sure you're checking all the boxes and hit each drop down. So Li Meng, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and we're going to talk about uh, the first wine. These are the uh, results here uh, that, uh, that we found. A uh, panel of three will always taste every single wine. Wines are uh, pre-triaged out of flights. So uh, whatever the particular category is, uh, three of us will sit down, uh, go through it, pick out the most representative wines, then reach out for the producers and their importers and make sure they give us a two thumbs up to rebottle the wines and use them in our kit. So the first wine here, you should all have wine one in your hand. Um, nothing particular to bring out in the appearance. Appearance is something we do, but as we know, uh, you shouldn't spend way too much time there and overthink it. But I think the, the notes there speak pretty, uh, pretty consistent to what it was. I do think that um, the green, uh, while it is there, perhaps sort of verged a little brassier than usual. And I think that'll be something that comes out perhaps as we talk about what this wine is specifically. Uh, within the points on the, on the fruits here, uh, there is a little bit of everything. Um, I found the nature of the citrus fruit here, although there's a lot of terms, what popped out of me when I tasted this morning was really that sort of sweeter side, more that Meyer lemony thing rather than the lemon. Meyer lemons, of course, being a cross between a lemon and an orange proper, a little bit more on the grapefruity stuff today. Uh, while it is under ripe and, and tart and fresh, it definitely pushed more fresh and definitely more fruit. Uh, a lot more tree fruit here. Uh, quince, which obviously you should be eating cooked. Don't eat it raw. It'll upset your stomach and yellow apples. And again, more parts of the fruit itself. Um, stone fruit definitely sings in this wine and I think is really much a, uh, a marker to what um, you might end up with here or there. But I found all of the elements showing today, uh, perhaps a little bit on the, on the riper side. So maybe leaning more towards the peaches and away from the others and uh, very much in that apricot thing. And again, more fresh to me um, than under ripe and tart. Um, but that's sort of the way it's showing today. Remember that our palates change every day, guys, and the way a wine tastes today may not taste exactly the same tomorrow. Very strong florals, and if you've gone back to this wine uh, multiple passes, you'll note that the florals are jumping out more so with each pass. I noticed a lot of, um, of honeysuckle and apples this time, and I'm getting a little bit more of that creamy freshness of the elderflower uh, this time here. Definitely fresh, um, no other veggies to speak of, and, and sort of a nice sweet nuancer taste of sort of chamomile and, uh, and chervil in there, sort of sweet, bright sort of things. A uh, little bit of ginger, um, perhaps more the powder than the, than the, the uh, fruit here. And then um, on the earth side, uh, very much speaking to the sort of mineral rocky end. Um, I'm not getting as much uh, petrol TDN, and, but some of you might be more sensitive to it than I am. Uh, no animals, no critters, all the other stuff is fresh uh, and bright. A um, little bit of sulfury stuff going on there, maybe a clue to where we are, but who knows? And then nothing specific in the winemaking to speak of whatsoever. And then as far as um, other stuff goes, um, uh, put it in your mouth if you haven't done so. Clearly an off dry wine um, with an acid de definition. Um, to me, it comes off high. If some of you think it's a little bit more in the medium plus range, I get it. Um, and again, there is some sweetness there and sweetness can sometimes um, shave off a little bit of your perception there, but if you play, if you juxtapose the sugar against the acid, the acid is indeed high. Uh, the alcohol level is definitely in the medium, pushing lower. Uh, no phenolics to speak of. Very much in the lean, bright side, and um, I'm still tasting it. So I, I hope you are too, and definitely some complexity here. So on that note, 
couple of thoughts in mind. Let's uh, talk a little bit about what could it possibly be, Lee Meng, if you want to pop me to the next yep. slide. So, yeah, go ahead. So we're, we're trying this out. So humor us. We're going to put the grape variety and the region up here. Our goal, as you can see on the PowerPoint, um, Hold on one second. If you guys could just take a moment to fill out what you think, what you thought it was even before you revealed it. Um, because we're trying to figure out, you know, where else people were going. And the and, and don't be shy. If you thought of something else and if you pick other, please go ahead and put it in the chat box or in the Q&A what you thought it was. It really helps for us to explain why it wasn't the, the varieties that, and we really took some time to pick out three other varieties that it could be. Yeah. So, so just to add, Li Meng, um, one of the varieties, uh, or one of the four, I should say, is correct. The other three are incorrect. And then we've got pairings of a couple of old world and a couple of new world choices of uh, general world. And then, of course, a country that's in there. And by the way, if you haven't tasted, um, and you just want to try and be clairvoyant here based on some of the clues, <laughs> You should go ahead and vote as well too um, before we reveal it. So we may give us a sense of how we're doing, what percentage of our participants have uh, voted, and then we'll. Um, I'm going to give you ten more seconds, and then I'm going to close the voting and share the results, and then we'll talk about where people are ending up. We don't have an other for region, so if you have some other regions that you were thinking that weren't any of these four regions, please also either put it in Q and A or in the chat as well. All right, here we go. I'm going to end the polling. And I'm going to share the results. This is where people thought uh, things were. 82% uh, of you thought that it was Riesling. 15% thought it was Shenan. And in other, I see that there was a Gruner uh, comment. Hi, Christian. I hope you're doing well in Ohio. Um, and then in terms of regions, most people went in Germany, but some people went with France and Washington. Um, there was also a potential uh, Australia, even though uh, Carl said maybe it wasn't dry enough to be from Australia. So Evan? Well, let's go ahead and close this out and hit the next slide and tell everybody that those of you who are in the big uh, camp of, uh, of Germany and all that, you ended up being, do, 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 correct. Uh, for one second. I'm not controlling the deck, so. But anyway, while, you're, while we're waiting for the tech to pop up here, um, it is in fact a German Riesling. It is a 2018 uh, wine. It's a, from uh, Joel, George Albrecht Schneider. It's a Mirsteiner Potterberg 2018. You can say that 10 times fast. I won't give you a ticket when you're speeding down the road. Uh, this wine comes from the Rhine Heston. And um, well, the Rhine Heston, as all of you know, is, is the largest of the, of the regions within Germany proper. It is the part of the world that gave us lead from Milch a long time ago. But what's interesting about this wine, and we're obviously the, the varietal and the uh, country sung to most all of you, and bravo to you there, um, is that uh, it's it, it styles. So a couple of things I thought would be worth highlighting. First of all, 2018 vintage. I happened to be in Germany on holiday with my family in part of 2018. And I will tell you that um, not one day that was there when it didn't drop below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It was a very, very warm year. And according to the German wine people, uh, the wine counting, the Uxla level was at 90 by August 6th. And acidity is therefore with a very ripe year, we're a little bit more on the moderate side. So if it seemed a bit softer to you than typical, this is where vintage very much is speaking uh, to the wine itself. Uh, the soils here in the southern end of Nierstein tend to be more limestone based than, uh, than sort of slaty and all of that here. So you're definitely picking up a minerality to it, but not necessarily a slatiness to it. And even though it's limestone, there's enough lists and loam there that it doesn't give you that sort of screaming uh, chalkiness to it. Um, in general, I find the wines from Rhein Hessen to be a little bit softer and a little bit um, uh, richer than, uh, some, than their, their Mosul counterparts, not quite as chiseled as uh, what you would find in the Rhine Gau, but, uh, but a, a really delicious wine. And um, I hope you enjoyed it uh, too. Evan, uh, just a couple of questions that uh, came through. Can you address why it doesn't um, have markers of Gruner, Shannon? or even Sylvaner? Yeah, I, I think if it were um, Shannon, uh, it would probably be much more higher on the, on the tree fruit uh, end of things. The only types of Shannons to me that show the same way Riesling do, and obviously Madeline and, and Tim can jump in here, uh, tend to be those either that are um, 
from South Africa that are on the bone dry style, or if you're going to be in France, probably Savonnier or something like that, which can pick up sort of Riesling-esque things, especially in its youth. But usually they tend to be more apple-y, more uh, tree-ish. Uh, the fruit can oftentimes in a riper year be bruised. In 2018, the wines in the Loire Valley are quite fat. Um, and this wine still has enough definition that, that definitely makes it scream um, uh, Riesling to you. In terms of Gruner, that's an interesting call because in a really ripe year, you tend to downplay uh, the sort of more green pea and the caraway and the, and the, um, the bean elements of it. And it does end up pronouncing itself more like Riesling than otherwise. But uh, here in this case, to me, it, it, um, it, it definitely uh, spoke there. Washington State would have been an interesting call as well for somebody I think said that out there simply because of the weight in a riper year. Uh, that would be an interesting thing. And uh, Carl's choice of saying, yeah, maybe it's a little too sweet to be Aussie. Spot on, spot on. Uh, Tim, Madeline, anything you'd like to add? Well, someone just uh, commented very correctly that it's got a fizzy aspect to it because uh, my glass had bubbles as well. So there's a thought. And um, also, I think if you do get the uh, fingerprint of um, petrol or matchstick, that can be a tell that pulls you closer to Riesling as opposed to Chenet as well. I like looking at the, the broad, simple strokes. Tim? Yeah, you know, for me, uh, certainly uh, Riesling, the TDN factor, higher acid, but not high. But, you know, I, I didn't get any alcohol. <clears throat> and when I checked, it was 8.5%. So, yeah, can only be. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Well, hopefully you all enjoyed that wine. And um, we're going to move on now to mm -hmm. wine number two. And uh, Madeline, just, you want to take us just through a that second. one? If there, yep. are, any, if there are any other questions, uh. um, please, we do have a couple of minutes for this. And there was a specific question on from Peter Granoff. I love it. Hi, Peter. <laughs> hey, Peter. Um, explain please explain TDN. So if any of you are um, able to explain TDN to our viewers. Thank you, Peter. T Tim, you're, 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 our, you're our man on this. Why don't you take us okay. through that? So uh, TDN is uh, an acronym for a really long chemical compound, which 116 dimethyl dihydronaphthalene 1, 2. And uh, it was isolated by German scientists in only in 2006. And it accounts for the fusel, petroly, dieselly uh, characteristic, you know, you find often in Riesling, but other grape varieties too. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what it is. And what, and Tim, what would be some of the other grape varieties where you might find it? Uh, often a Grunewald Liener or even some uh, in ripe vintages of Alsace wine too. Mm -hmm. like and I, I've actually found it for those of you who are fans of Portuguese wine, Arintu, sure. uh, when it gets a little bit older, starts to develop a bit of that TDN character. Yeah. Um, there's another question um, from Eugene here. Does Gruner typically have a fizzy quality to it? Well, the, 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 the slight effervescence that many of you have pointed out here probably has as much to do with the youth of the wine as anything. And the fact that oftentimes uh, bright white wines, particularly aromatic white wines, um, are, are, are kept fresh uh, and bright as long as possible. They usually put a little CO2 uh, in, in uh, the tank stuff. And so the wines come off of effervescent uh, when you pour them right out of the bottle. You'll note that over time, you can tell that it's not um, bound effervescence by simply swirling the wine and the effervescence dissipating over the time. But when you find it in a wine, be it Riesling, you can find it in other varieties too, Muscat, Sauvignon Blancs, various varietals. Oftentimes, unless it's a specific style, like say Moscato Diasti, it's usually a dead ringer for a sign of a usually very youthful wine. All right, so on to wine two, Madeline. All right. Um, I didn't taste this this morning, but I did taste it about an hour ago, and I just retasted it because I feel about wine the way I do about people. I like to pay complete attention to them uh, when they're in front of me. And also, uh, from our last webinar, people um, made several comments, if I can refer to this, that it's confusing when you have this many options, and how do you focus and um, select options and not get rattled with uh, all the possibilities. And I made the suggestion, what I do is I make sure I have a very clean, simple, um, personal assessment of the wine before I look at options. So you might wanna play with that. That way I'm not swayed by what's in front of my face. So that said, at this tasting, what's interesting to me is 
On the nose, it has a very different expression than it does on the palate. This is not a good or bad thing, it just is. And there's really nothing notable uh, to mention about the color other than uh, there is a little bit of green glint and that's always helpful to look for that because that is um, the, um, the bell ringer for, for youth or relative youth. And um, uh, the key lime, lemon and high toned white citrus fruits are quite present on the palate. Whereas the slightly, you know, uh, rounder, riper, sweeter uh, citrus fruits like oran and tangerine are more on the nose. And you'll, you'll notice we've noted um, uh, a very wide range of fruit condition, underripe, tart, fresh, and ripe. And I think that that does vary on the nose and on the palate as well, the palate being uh, significantly more um, tart and underripe. Um, if you look at um, the, the fruit, I'm absolutely getting green apple and green pear again on the palate. And then when, you, when we go down to the stone fruit, the nectarine, um, is present in a nice fresh and I would even say ripe form on the nose for sure. So it's got a, a different fruit expression. And if we can see the next um, slide we made, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Again, at this tasting, I don't know as I smell or taste, uh, oops, I'm waiting for it, hold on. There it is, yay. I'm um, not getting any passion fruit on this, but certainly, especially aromatically, that combination of different types of um, melon and then um, pretty uh, florality on the nose, though it's not dominant. And I wouldn't get too confused between lemon, lime, and orange blossom, just a gentle um, fruit blossom aroma. Now on the palate, I have to admit, I get a little bit more of a green element than just salad greens. And uh, I don't know as I would express it other than saying perhaps some fresh parsley and some um, grass under herbal. When we tasted this, we mentioned um, lemongrass and verbena. And if I remember correctly, we actually had an argument about, <laughs> about those two. But again, you have a, a white citrus spice. I would say on the nose, there's a little bit of a, a warmer baking spice that hasn't been defined here. So I'm curious to see if anybody pipes up about that. Um, in terms of earth, uh, really nada, oak aging, if there is some, there's just a kiss. You know, it's not overt, but the aromatics especially speak to it. Um, you know, so again, it's, it's, I think we're correctly expressing it as low or, or a blended oak as opposed to overt oak. A little bit of a, a nutty character. Least contact, is there um, a richness to it? Yes, but I find it on the palate, again, more sleek. So I find this wine very intriguing in that um, the aromatics and uh, the flavors are not discordant, but they're not uh, necessarily one and the same, which adds to complexity, right? So let's go to the mouthfeel. You guys want to pipe up about anything or did I cover it okay for you thus no, far? No, I, th I think you've, uh, you've hit it spot on. I, I, I would concur with you that, uh, and it's interesting how your palates are different on different days. Mm -hmm. I concur with you that there's a green element to it. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more pungent today uh, mm -hmm. than when I remember tasting it last mm -hmm. time, but there is this sort of interesting uh, conflation of a roundness and creaminess, but it mm -hmm. still has that sort of bright, sharp um, mm -hmm. linearity uh, to it in the palate. And I'm grateful for it because both of those speak to what this wine may be. So in terms of structural, it is dry. Acidity, I d wouldn't even consider medium on this. This is medium plus and positively mouthwatering if I can, you know, qualify it a little bit. Alcohol, I can feel it in my chest. I mean, it's not hot, but it's not invisible. It's not the Riesling at 8.5, right? Uh, phenols, none. Okay, round and smooth. And again, funnily enough, that impression is given on the nose, but doesn't follow through completely on the palate. So that's neat. It's long. I can still taste it. I can still feel it. I would say complexity medium plus plus actually. So that speaks to a uh, high quality. And then I have to say, I want to say bravo to the person who on um, wine number one was having a good time concluding what it was without, um, tasting the Riesling. So I'm curious if anyone's going to be able to do that with this wine as well. So mm -hmm. let's go on to what it. So, so we're going to go to the poll first mm -hmm. and I'm going to relaunch uh, poll number two now. 
And so you should see in front of you uh, four choices for grape variety. And once again, um, please answer quickly. And uh, you have four choices here for region. If the region that you thought it was, again, I know a lot of you know what it is, but this is for, for what you thought it was so that we can help uh, illuminate if you thought it was something else, why it isn't that. And feel free to drop um, any questions in the Q&A section. Uh, there is one from Mary, and as people are answering the poll, are these wines all single varietals, no blends? And I'll ask Evan if you could answer the question on our selection process, if we only choose single varietals versus blends. Sure, yeah, no, that's an excellent question, Mary. Thank you for asking it. Um, the answer is no, we have both blended options and varietal options. Now the varietal options, we work within the auspices of uh, international uh, parameters. So for us, it has to be 85% or above uh, to carry the varietal uh, moniker, even if it says 75%, but it isn't. And if it speaks to a blend, we'll put it the other way. But there are a number of styles of wines around the world, whether you're in Bordeaux for reds and whites, whether you're in Spain uh, for reds and whites, Italy for reds and whites, and many, many places where blend, Portugal for reds and whites, where blends are the style. So you note um, when you go through there, oftentimes you will have the choice as you do here for your third choice of picking a style that's blended, which means that the grape varietal is not going to be uh, predominant and certainly not hitting at least the 85% rule. Great. I'm going to reveal the wine. Oh, wait a minute. We don't have, you're not going to review it. Oh, sorry. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to end the poll. Sorry about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. <laughs> when you see everything, it's hard. There are too many choices. Okay, so I'm going to share the results. The results are 60% of the folks thought it was Sauvignon Blanc, 14% Chardonnay, and 17% Rhone. And for those of you who thought it was others, I don't see in the chat or in the Q&A what you thought it was. So please do drop it in there. Um, and as far as region goes, Maddie, there was uh, France, I think is the dominant one. Spain, at th mm -hmm. uh, one person thought it was Spain. Um, and then 29% thought it was California. And then five people thought it was Australia. So you kind of have it everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, there was another region, which is um, New Zealand as a uh, alternative to Australia. Um, and there was also a question about whether or not it was Shannon for the ones who thought that it was other. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, get rid of the poll and do the review. There we go. And, and Trala, now what's very interesting to me looking at the label, you know, one look at it's worth a lot of money. And then looking at the polls is we have 60% um, of the people calling it correctly Sauvignon Blanc, though um, I think both Chardonnay and Rhone blend was not a bad um, veer, especially because of the aromatics and the presence of a little bit of oak. But it's interesting when you say old world France, we all know that that could mean what? A Bordeaux blend, but it could also mean, right, Upper Loire, which is 100% Sauvignon Blanc. So the question, um, was very appropriate. Um, is this uh, a mono varietal or not? And actually it is not. It has a significant amount of semio in it, 16%, uh, and a small portion of it has been barrel fermented. And of that small portion, um, some of it is new oak. Um, you know, uh, we forget about Sauvignon Blanc in California, and I'm very happy to hear see that almost 30% of the people considered that or actually thought it was or you know, we're, we're moving in that direction. Um, I think in terms of varietal, when you hit a wine like this and you're, um, you just have to pay very close attention to what are the varietal uh, tags, which in this case really appeared not so much aromatically to me as on the palate. Very interesting wine. And that's where the tart tricks, citrus, the green elements, the fresh herbs, you know, um, reared their heads. Whereas on the nose, we got more of the ripeness uh, that speaks to a relatively warm growing region, right? Rutherford Napa and the presence of oak. But none of us, or at least I didn't, and when we tasted it, we didn't pick up any earth elements. So note to self, if you're sitting there thinking, hmm, Sauvignon Blanc, possibly a blend, possibly a touch of oak, and you're trying to place it in a continent, go back to the simplest 
question. Is it showing elements of um, a growing region like Bordeaux or not? And in this case, um, I think even though it's complex, the fruit expression um, and the, the final open roundness of the wine speaks to the New World, specifically the Napa Valley. It's really delicious, but it's very interesting to me. I think the, the, the white Rhone consideration is interesting as well, but both the Chardonnay and the Rhone don't sing true on the palate with um, that uh, mouthwatering acidity, especially with the Rhone consideration and the green elements. Mm -hmm. And Maddie, what about Pinot Grigio? For you, how is this not a Pinot Grigio? Um, actually, the I go I, again. I sometimes when I'm for Klimt, uh, to use a cool word meaning confused, I go back to the simplest question of all. Is this an aromatic, highly aromatic, moderately aromatic, or non-aromatic grape variety? I think Pinot Grigio is a little bit too low-toned for it to be, um, you know, confused with this wine. And I think also the quality of the acidity with Pinot Grigio is simply less compelling, and it doesn't have as much um, tart white citrus notes. Um, also, you know, the presence of oak on the nose, if I were doing this deductively, would take me away from Pinot Grigio as well, especially if it were being chosen by people who are not mean and giving it to you in <laughs> a wine tasting. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question here. Why is this Rutherford and not Carneros? And I think, Ooh. you know, we're not, we're not uh, trying to name the markers down to that level. Um, I'm going to ask if, Evan, you want to take that one. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I mean, I think the biggest single difference is two, I mean, is, is twofold. Number one, I mean, a, if you think about it just sort of logically, there's just not that much Sauvignon Blanc planted down in Carneros at this point in time. At one point in time, there was. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember when Carneros was literally a tapestry and a hodgepodge of varieties and people were planting everything and everything was there. I think the warmer citrus elements that Madeline pointed out earlier suggest more up valley um, and, uh, and, and certainly more, more north and more, more, uh, more warmth. Um, I think what's very interesting here is, and it's unfortunate, uh, you know, Madeline mentioned and I would reiterate, um, thank you for saying I'm ancient, Peter. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, but I, I, I do think that it's a shame that, that we're not seeing as much Sauvignon right. Blanc in places like Napa and in places like uh, Sonoma County. You still find some in Dry Creek, you still find some in Lake, you still find some in uh, the southern central coast, but frankly, the land's um, too valuable uh, for other varieties that might be Napa Valley. It's you know it's Cabernet and it's it's perhaps Merlot and in in, uh, in Sonoma it's other varieties too. So we don't see as much of it, and we oftentimes lose the uh, the, the possibility of sharing these delicious wines. I think what's interesting here is to me what stuck out in this wine as well was the presence of the Semillon. You know, I always when I get that sort of Adriatic fig, that green fig character which at least to me jumped out today, um, that sort of roundness in the palate, which is obviously echoed by, by the oak and the leaves contact. I get that sort of Bordelais blend thing. And then to me, what keeps me in California as opposed to say Australia is the uh, SBS or SSBs that you find in Australia tend to be leaner and meaner. Uh, more often than not, there's not as many of those interpretations. And ditto, you know, unless you're making say, um, gosh, Tococo, uh, at Cloudy Bay in New Zealand, they tend to be a little bit more in the brash style as well or two. There's only a handful of spots in the world that make uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc style blends that are like this. Um, I, I have a question here from Natasha, but I have to move to the next wine. So Natasha will definitely get to your question mm -hmm. offline. Um, and I also want to answer directly the question about the oak. I've got um, that stat. If, if you don't have it, do you have it in front I, of you? I do have it. It's 25% mm -hmm. uh, French, 15% new, 10% neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for those fast fingers. All right, on to the next wine. Tim, I believe you're up. I'm up. Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. So uh, let's take a look at wine number three. And uh, it's definitely star bright, reflects a lot of light. It's definitely clear. And then it's a medium yellow. And it's definitely deeper in color than the first two wines. There's still a touch of green, which speaks to either a cool climate or youth. And then no bubbles in my glass. In terms of nose and palate, starting, uh, there's, you know, quite a bit of citrus fruit. Uh, little bit of Swedish, but mostly tart. We've got lemon and lime both, a little bit sweeter in terms of Meyer lemon. And the condition is mostly fresh and ripe and a little bit of really ripe 
uh, tree fruit coming up and then zest peel, etc. In terms of tree fruit, ripe, not green apples. So both yellow and red, Asian pear, and maybe some brown pear and very fresh and ripe, especially on the palate. A little bit of stone fruit, not too much. And that of course is fresh and ripe as well. And then go to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry. Uh, there we go. All right, <clears throat> into the, there's, uh, yes, definitely some tropical fruit here. And I'll, I'll speak to that at the end in terms of, uh, you know, a hunch I have. So banana, melon, mango, things like that. Again, fresh and ripe. There is some apple blossom and, you know, honeysuckle above the nose. I mean, above the glass and the nose, very fresh, no vegetal. In fact, it's a very, if, if, you know, everybody out there in cyberland, you should smell this wine and then go back and smell the Sauvignon Blanc because then you'll see that the pyrazines, all the green notes in the Sauvignon Blanc are strong and they're completely absent in this wine. Um, no vegetal type notes, see a little bit of mushroomy quality, a little ginger root, uh, just that faintest hint of anything that is herbal. And I think chamomile and verbena are the closest things there. Uh, there are definitely spices, probably a lot of them having to do with oak, which we'll get to in a moment. And then in terms of uh, earth and mineral, no mineral whatsoever, a little bit of mushroomy quality, no animal, but there's definitely oak aging. And this really sets this wine apart from the previous two white wines, okay? Maybe medium oak intensity and everything from baking spices to butterscotch, vanilla, even a little bit of brown sugar. And that oak aging adds some oxidative note like hazelnut, chestnut, peanut shell, and then really no chemical compounds. Perceived winemaking choices though, here are really important because they're both fairly prominent. And the first one is the butter and buttercream, you know, diacetyl from malolactic. And then uh, kind of a creme fraiche, almost yogurty note, especially on the palate that you get from Lee's contact. So just a heads up for everybody keeping score, we've got three really strong winemaking influences in terms of malolactic, Lee's contact, and oak. Okay, finishing up on the structure, it is dry. The acid here is medium. Uh, medium plus would almost be a stretch. The alcohol is medium plus. You can feel a little bit of warmth down there. Uh, no phenolic bitterness. And the texture is definitely creamy and buttery. And, and all of that speaks to, again, least contact, malolactic and use of oak. The finish is medium plus. Balance is really, really good and delicious. And, and you know, medium plus complexity. So I think we set everybody up pretty well there. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna put up the, um, so yes, it yeah. was, and let's put up our poll league, man. Okay. Oh, sorry, wait a minute. I'm gonna relaunch wine number three. There we go. So right now we have four choices for you in grape variety, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, Tarantes, and other. If you have other, please, um, I see the results coming in. Everyone's pretty firm that it was Chardonnay as they <laughs> guessed. Um, if you have other, again, please drop that into either Q&A or into the chat. Um, a lot of people thought it was California, but we do have some who thought that it was France. So Are the Tim, results done? Are the results done yet, Remain? Do no, not yet. I'm, I'm still giving people time. I'm just telling you where, just to prepare Tim on what he should be answering. Um, so Tim, I think um, as results come in, be prepared to talk about why France or versus California. And then there was the question of um, Argentina. 10 more seconds, and then I'm going to close the poll. There are some uh, comments in chat that maybe it was Semyon, maybe Rousson, Marson, Rousson Plan from Rhone. But overwhelmingly, there is, and I'm going to end it right here and share the results. Um, Chardonnay, wow. 84%, and uh, New World, California, 86%. Um, but there is a, a contingent for Old World, France. So, and then, as I mentioned, the varietals before were the other. Uh, Roussant blend, Tim, if you can address that. Okay. Yep. Uh-oh. Did Tim freeze? I think Tim did freeze. <laughs> Maybe while, while Tim is frozen, Evan, you can address either variety or vintage. Or he's, he's, having, he's having reveal anxiety. What can we say? You know? 
Um, I think what, what's interesting here is, is obviously people are kind of all over the variety. And let me know when Tim comes back in. I don't want to steal it. And I'm going to reveal, while we're waiting for Tim to come back, I'm going to reveal the wine as well. Yeah. Um, for those who thought that it was Chardonnay, it is indeed Chardonnay. And for those of you who thought it was from California, which obviously it was associated with, it is from there. What I do want to come back to is, you know, clearly Chardonnay is, is a wine which, you know, you could argue is as much about hand as it is about land. And uh, as Tim brought up before, whether it was the malolactic, whether it was the uh, use of lees contact, the uh, uh, deft use of oak here, you know, I, I thought this wine showed it well without being... Um, a two by four was really nice. I think the folks who make this wine are very sensitive to uh, style here. But what was really fun here and where, where I thought this wine to me was sort of a bit of an aha moment is it's not that often in this day and age with so much of available Chardonnay and uh, out there that we remember Monterey County. You know, we tend to go north, we tend to go south. Mm -hmm. We forget that Monterey um, was so seminal, particularly in the 80s and early 90s, for what Chardonnay is all about. And we've all moved on to other places. But when they hit, they hit well. I think the folks at this winery do a good job. But really, um, those strong tropical notes, the melon notes, the banana notes, the, the, such that 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 Tim brought up earlier, to me, um, that plus sort of a voluminous um, texture in the mouth are, are sort of calling cards for the Monterey County area. I'm going to jump in on that too because somebody just asked a question why Monterey and not Sonoma and I think Monterey has um, tropical and also there's just a translucent purity of fruit from Monterey that I just love that even when it's paired with uh, oak it's not uh, masked but certainly pineapple and banana and I think the other thing here that um, was uh, was telling for New World Chardonnay specifically is the nuttiness is really pronounced and it's sweet. You know, it's um, uh, more macadamia than anything else to me, but mm -hmm. I think this is just such pretty wine. So Tim is back. Tim, will you answer why not Roussan or Marsan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, those wines uh, at this age really have not a lot of character. I mean, they're very powerful, concentrated white wines. Um, they need bottle age, right? Yeah, they need a lot of bottle age, and they're both the, both those grapes and wines are very phenolic. So there's a lot of bitterness on the finish. Elevated alcohol, you would expect 14.5 plus, and probably a lot of new oak. So uh, this wine is just elegant and restrained by comparison. Tim, could you could you address the issue? Somebody, a couple people did vote for France. Uh, they got the varietal, obviously, but they ended up in France. Why why would you end up in California and not in France? Uh, well, several reasons. First of all, I mean structure. The acid's not high enough. Uh, second of all, well, this. Okay, I'm going to get to that in a second. There's really a complete lack of mineral quality to this, and there's very little earthiness. And then finally, the tropical character on this particular Chardonnay is not only the place, but I would venture a guess it's the clone. I think this is Winte clone Chardonnay. It smells like juicy fruit gum. Okay. And over 60% of all the Chardonnay in California is Winte, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is Winte clone. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we're gonna move on to the next wine. If you have questions, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, and Tim, this is you again, uh, wine number four, please. Okay. Now for something completely different. <laughs> Everybody, as you're taking a look at this, you know, hopefully you've got it over a white background and uh, it is day bright. It is clear. You can still read through it. But, uh, you know, the color here, there's some oxidation. It says ruby, you know, the glass I'm looking at is ruby garnet. So there's definitely a little bit of oxidation, which makes me think of overall age or Maybe to spend some extended time in oak. We'll find out. Uh, what else about it? The rim variation, yeah, to me, just a much more evolved uh, ruby garnet. And there is a slight bit of staining of the tears, but not too much. Okay, on the nose and the palate. Um, again, to me, oxidation, uh, evolving maturation. So there's definitely a red plum, almost prune. There's, to me, a dried and ripe. Uh, it's... You know, I'm looking at the notes and to me, the wine to me is much more dried and raisinated today. Uh, predominantly red fruit, so there's raspberry, cherry, currant, plum, things like that. There is some black fruit to me, it's more in the plum, berry, almost uh, big range. 
And there is a little tart element to it, especially on the palate, but generally it is ripe and dried, raisinated. And I like the, uh, there's definitely some orange, dried orange peel on it. Mm, yeah. Again, there's a lot of oxidative notes. To me, uh, a lot of oxidative barrel type notes. All right. And then in terms of non-fruit, uh, there's dried rose, there's potpourri, uh, most of the floral, a little bit of fresh, but mainly dry. There's a dried leafy green element to it. And we mentioned tomatoes before, but it's almost tomato leafy and sun-dried tomatoes. It's almost Mediterranean in quality, very mushroomy. I love the fennel call. And then there's definitely some uh, strong herbal notes, but here not so much from fruit, but probably oak treatment. And that's the uh, mint and the dill and tobacco leaf. Mm, some really nice licorice and ginger powder also from oak. Uh, and then really, unlike the first three wines, this wine is all about earth and mineral. So it's forest floor, it's dried mushrooms, it's turned soil. There is hard, almost terracotta, sun-baked earth to it. And, you know, with extended time in oak, there's, you know, there's a little bit of what we think might be Britannomyces. So there's a little leather, little blood, little iodine. And then extended oak aging to be, uh, you know, certainly the, the sandalwood, the vanilla, the sweet spices, um, but very oxidative. And, you know, uh, I would say there's both VA and Britannomyces on this. Yeah. And so other than that, I think it's, yeah. And then on the palate, I think it's very dry. The acid is medium plus. It's very lifted. The alcohol is medium plus at best. And tannin, medium plus. There's a lot of oak tannin here, but it's very well integrated in the wine, which speaks to how long the wine was in oak. And then uh, a little bit of grittiness and astringency because of all the oak. Finish to me, it says medium plus. I'm going long on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, complexity, yeah, I'm, I'm just this side of high with it. So it's medium plus plus. It's really nice wine. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, just a question that came in early. Do you get a meaty quality on this wine? Yeah, I do. So that's part of the, the whole blood iodine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, all, right. all right, so we're, we're bring up the magic survey. Yeah, we're going to bring up the survey. Um, so again, this we know that you know what the wine is for some of you, um, but we're just really looking for you guys to um, guess, tell us what you thought it was and for learning purposes. So Tempranillo, Sangiovese, Carignan or other. And again, other, please drop that into the Q&A. And then in terms of regions, Old world, we have Italy and Spain, and new world, we have Oregon and Chile. So I'll give you guys a moment. In the meantime, uh, Tim, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about what were the dead giveaways that um, before, you, before we reveal, reveal the wines, what do you think was the most important element on um, the profile that you tasted that led you down to where, whichever part, path you went down? Well, you know, this is uh, red fruit dominant wine in terms of, of fruit profile, the acid is fairly high. Uh, the tannin though is not too much. And there's not a lot of grape tannin, but there's also extended time in oak. And I think there's, you know, with the, the dill and eucalyptus and things like that, I think it's some American oak, not all, uh, but quite a bit of time, maybe several years. And so that oxidative process and the fruit and also the structure, you know, definitely leads me to a specific grape in place. Great. So Tim, I put the results out here. Um, okay. 57% thought it was Tempranillo and 37% thought it was Sangiovese. And you can see that thinking going through to the region where because of the Sangiovese, 37% thought that it was Old World Italy. Um, and because of the Tempranillo, uh, most people thought that it was Old World Spain. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was also some Oregon in here. Um, and I, I love this comment um, from Shang Li that said that the wine has this Chinese restaurant, AKA sweet and sour uh, taste to it. Thank you for that. Tim, can you explain a little bit more about uh, Tempranillo versus Sangiovese as I reveal what this wine is? Sure, sure. I mean, from the structure alone, I mean, Sangiovese is more tannic and more acidic. And not only that, Sangiovese, a lot of grape tannins in the front of your mouth. And this had almost very little at all. This is mostly very, integrated melted tannins from oak but in the sides and the back of the palate 
And even a simple Chianti, not even a Chianti Classico, you get a lot of tannin in the front of your mouth and it's much more acidic wine, yeah. Uh, and then just the oxidative and the extended oak treatment. And the only thing in the Sangiovese universe that would come close would be Brunello, but that's still tannic and really acidic and it's a much richer wine. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tempranillo Spain, really, really good call here. And then just uh, just a note about the Carignan blend. I mean, Carignan's tannic, and it's also in the Cabernet universe, so much more depth of color, much richer, darker fruit, but uh, also the tannin. Mm -hmm. and, and Tim, there's a, qu a question here about Syrah, potentially from Northern Rhone. Uh, meaty, blood, black pepper quality, red fruit. Could it could have been a Syrah? No, because there's none of the, the, the pepper and the, you know, Northern Rhone Syrah, Syrah doesn't ripen evenly. And so wine like uh, Crozier Hermitage or um, La San Josef, something like that, you've got a broad range of fruit ripeness. So you've got raisinated fruit and really, really underripe green fruit. And then you've got pepper and then you do have, you know, to uh, whoever made the point, absolutely, from Britannomyces. I like the cat running across that one. That was really good. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so you might Only have for red wine. Wine. What's that? Only for red wine. She doesn't do yes. it for whites. <laughs> so you could have markers for Britannomyces, but you know, you have to, you know, everything else about the Northern Run Syrah would be completely different. May I interject quickly? Also, I think um, the meatiness of the Northern Rhone to me will usually have a pronounced smoky element to it. Mm. And the pepper will be distinctly will be quite distinct. It'll be um, verging on dominant and will be more white pepper than black pepper, so not so much heat. So I think the descriptives were bang on the money. Just consider the element of uh, smoked or smoked meat. One of my friends calls it the Jimmy Dean effect. <laughs> and I'm a vegetarian, so what do I know? Yeah, just a couple of other uh, of other ads and, and I thought a brilliant uh, articulation on the d deduction here. Rioja to me always has sort of two other things going on here. I, I concur that they tend to be um, red fruited in general. I oftentimes get sort of what I call like a, a strawberry fruit leather type character mm. to it uh, that's in there. And then oftentimes that sort of plumminess, that more savory element. But all those things that sort of you threw together, the, the, the spices, the, the mint, the eucalyptus, that, that all hits in that thing of what can, you can only describe as balsamico, which is obviously a knee-jerk nice. reaction to Rioja, but, but is literally, you know, framed uh, by this wine. I also think what's important here is um, this wine's not pure Tempranillo, and there is a, a certain choir-esque character here that speaks to the, the Masuelo, and I believe some Graciano that might be in here as well, too, um, that, that sort of makes it uh, more sort of a classic blend, although obviously led by, by the Tempranillo. Mm -hmm. yep. Great. All right. Um, we're going to move on to wine number five. I uh, believe Madeline is back to you. It's back to me. Yay. So um, I've had fun with this wine. And do I get rid of the, the poll or do you? I will oh, exit I get out. No, no, that's okay. Here. I got rid of it. Yay. So um, we are picking up wine number five. And, you know, I want to encourage one, uh, everyone to remember that the appearance is, is part of the pleasure, but also, you know, a really important part of the tell. Uh, so to hold the thought of the color, and I also find, especially if you get yourself uh, into a confused knot on an initial deduction, go back to the color, because it will often set you free. So that said, um, looking at this, certainly opaque, I couldn't read through it, and I'm proud of my eyesight. Um, certainly a true dark ruby in the center, but the rim variation is simply the same hue, only lighter. And that's what that means to me. You know, you don't have a gradation of color for this, from the center to the rim. So it's certainly, if nothing else, speaking to thick skin grape variety or grape varieties. Uh, and then on the nose, I actually <laughs> retasted it and giggled because to me, it's this wave of a trio of uh, ripe, dominantly uh, red fruit, oak, and earth. And then once my brain uh, or my senses process that, I can be a little bit more analytical about it. But I think the presence of those three elements has been very consistent as I've been tasting it over a couple of hours now. Um, certainly, certainly red fruit leads. And to me, you know, whether you want to call it red currant, red plum, um, on the, I'm going to retaste it really quickly. Hold the bolt. 
This wine too, and I, I, if those, for those of you out there who still have wine left in your glasses, go back to this. I, I found this wine of the entire flight of the six, the one that needed the most time mm -hmm. uh, to come around. I, I found it to be very taut initially, even after letting it sit for the proverbial 15 minutes. I found that at about 25 to 30, it started really coming into its own. Uh, and I actually found when I followed my own rule of topping it off that I shut it back down again and had to wait for it to come out. So note to self, if this is a wine that you like or you want to actually buy, I'd put it I'd put it away for a while and when I drank it I would decant it a good 30 or 40 mm -hmm. minutes ahead of time. Evan actually called me to make sure I understood this and had I paid close <laughs> attention to that aspect of it and I said yes thank you that's a true friend. Great. So um, you know the reason I wanted to retaste it and I'm, I'm glad you took the the time to jump in Evan is because there is a combination of quite right red currant and red plum on the nose, but on the palate, it verges into sour cherry because you have pronounced acidity on the palate. It's very interesting. Um, and then um, on the, uh, um, the black fruit is definitely not leading, but it's in there. It's second fiddle, but melted well in. Black currant, blackberry, black plum, a combination of fresh and ripe. You know, no blue fruit to, to my perception, and I will tell you, that the whole blue fruit category is uh, those of us who've been around for a while was something I had to make friends with because uh, classically a couple of decades ago, I'm ancient too, Evan, we didn't talk about <laughs> blue fruit as much. Um, florality is certainly present on, this, uh, present on this wine and it's a beautiful expression of fresh and dry. Don't tie yourself into knots if you can't really determine what specific flower it is and whether, um, it's fresh or dried, but do note it if it's there. And I would say probably at this tasting, I would, I would not veer towards lilac because that's pretty dominant. And I think it's a quiet violet and rose, but very pretty and distinct, um, both on the nose and on the palate. It's got a, pre a presence of green elements, a little bit of pyrazine for sure, though it's not obnoxious, you know, both black and green olives. Um, and that um, combination of fennel, anise, and you'll see other spices that licorice, I consider those all sort of in the same cool toned um, uh, camp. A little bit of uh, mint eucalyptus, but I think it's more sort of a pretty mixed herb quality. The aromatics on this wine, once you get past that blast of um, oak and earth and red fruit is, is quite complex. Organic earth, Absolutely. I mean, it smells, uh, frankly, like dusty forest floor to me. Um, inorganic, yeah, but it's certainly not the, 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 the dominant earth quality. Um, oak intensity on the nose, certainly more than on the palate, but I would hasten to say, remember the color? No color variation, and it's uh, saturated almost to the rim, and the fact that Evan felt strongly it needed air. This is speaking of youth. So quite often the oak will be a little bit pushier on the nose than on the palate. Um, all sorts, you know, take your pick and how you want to describe the, the oak influence. To me, it's pretty classic um, cedar, maybe a little bit of vanilla. Um, I don't get Botanomyces on these and on this wine, maybe the little hint of animal, a little hint of leather, but I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty, pretty sensitive to it because I don't like it to command my attention. Um, but I find this wine to be young, highly aromatic, mouth filling, mouth filling, layered um, with, you know, dominant red berry fruit, some black, significant amount of oak, strong earth element, and structurally, I swallowed that one. I liked it. I told you I was having fun with it. You may want to so, change the slide. Yep, we need the slide change. It is bone dry. Acidity is absolutely medium plus uh, and actually refreshing in this particular wine. Alcohol, yeah, medium plus, but it works fine. It's not pulling your attention. It works and it gives the wine some heft. Tannin, medium plus, but you know, I wouldn't call these hard tannins. They are drying, but you can taste the wine through it. I think it's important not only to qualify tannins, uh, to quantify tannins, but to qualify them as well, because that can be very much uh, a little whisper as to what it is. Gritty and astringent, lightly, you know, um, it's not what I would call hard finish. Medium plus, not as long as some of the whites, interestingly, but I think it's because it's young. And I think that um, 
the, the finish is more textural than it is flavor. Um, and we talked about the complexity, medium to medium plus at this moment, but I think it will develop with bottle age. Mm -hmm. And we have our poll coming, mm -hmm. yay. I think the poll is very excitingly known. <laughs> awesome. So we have um, varieties in front of you, Cabernet Sauvignon, Bordeaux Blend, Red, uh, Cabernet Franc, or other. And feel free to drop again what you think other could be. Um, I will let the poll run for a bit, um, up to a minute. And in terms of regions, your choices are Italy, France, Washington, or New Zealand. And of course, again, if you have other, drop that in. Um, and I will tell you, uh, there's a front runner right now, it's Bordeaux Blend, but let's see where things end up. Mm -hmm. And about that's important. Yeah, just to add to that, because obviously we put this together. Once again, it, it gets back to that whole sort of choir versus singularity mm -hmm. of stuff. And clearly here, Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc are looked at as either exclusive or prominent varietals, whereas Bordeaux blend truly speaks to, you know, the fact that it's, it's not leaning one heavy individual varietal and something else being there. Great. And I also want to add that the poll is anonymous, if I didn't say that enough in the beginning. We don't see <laughs> what we're voting. Um, so that is really important. And for those of you who don't have the wine in front of you and want to play along from the descriptors, this is a really easy way to test your theory. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results. And here we go. 64% thought that it was Bordeaux blend red. Um, and 18% thought it was a pure Cabernet, 13% thought it was Cabernet Franc. So I think, Madeline, you do need to address blend versus Cabernet versus Cabernet Franc. Well, what's the elephant in the room right now is the M word, Merlot. I mean, and this uh, particular blend is 70% Merlot and the balance is not Cabernet Sauvignon, it's Cabernet Franc. Um, mm -hmm. It is uh, right bank. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Am I giving away the review? Well, go you know, it's okay. We're gonna go there. Because sure. the wine spoke to it, and I think it's important that we're we're translucent yeah. and we talk about it. You know, um, so to me, if it's going to be uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon uh, versus Bordeaux blend or Merlot uh, dominant left bank versus right bank consideration, you're really looking to the black fruit versus the combination of red and black fruit. You're also looking to the um, the tannin quality. Um, and you're looking to the aromatics beyond graphite um, and fruit. You know, that's where the florality comes in and the herbs come in. And I'm not talking pyrazine. This is a, a pretty muscular little Lavanda Pomerol. You know, it was surprising to me. And 17 is not, you know, uh, I will give you, oh, the one percentage is, well, I can tell you what's planted. 70% Merlot, 30% Cabernet Franc, Zippo, Cabernet Sauvignon, though the, the black fruit certainly is in there. Um, what they plant and what they, you know, harvest depends on the vintage, of course. And 17, as I was saying, is not um, one of these, you know, uh, superstar vintages like 16. But I think this is a, a surprisingly full-bodied, mouth-filling, um, young red Bordeaux that is true to its character other than being, you know, um, a little bit harder in tannin than I would expect um, from this uh, appellation. You guys want to chime in at all? I, I, yeah, I, I thought, I, I, aside from the fact that I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a delicious wine, mm -hmm. um, I think it's fun to show people in this day and age, and hence the selection, um, some of these sort of uh, Cote appellations, the Cote de Bordeaux, you know, because we're so used to um, focusing in exclusively on, on sort of the, the higher rent uh, areas, if you will. Uh, there's so much value and deliciousness to be found in other parts, and especially with um, God forbid these 100% tax tariffs go through, but, you know, looking for deliciousness in Bordeaux at, in, in, at times, more and more of it can be found in the so-called so satellite areas. And La Lande de Pomerol, although there's maybe not as many producers there, the ones that are doing very well um, are doing very well. And in fact, I believe from this winery, you can actually see across uh, mm -hmm. to uh, Petrus. Um, so they, they share similarity of, uh, of terroir, and obviously Merlot does well there. Merlot is on these clay soils, it likes to, you know, likes to write feet as Christian Moyek would say. And really, I think to your point, Madeline, it sings uh, in this wine. 
And I think the franc is no small element in this wine as well, which is that that pretty aromatic comes in. But I think those of you who may have been veering towards the left bank, you know, um, I can see why. Uh, it's young, it's muscular, it's dark, and um, there you have it. But, you know, I think it was neat that um, uh, a lot of people did think it was a blend as opposed to a mono varietal or Cabernet dominant. Bravo. Um, Madeline, can you address why it's not Washington and also uh, um, why it's not Corvina slash Italy? Sure. Um, why it's not Washington, uh, that's actually a spectacular compliment to Washington State. And I agree with the spirit of it because Washington State certainly makes uh, terrific at best Cabernet and in uh, Bordeaux style blends. But remember the pronounced um, earthy component. I don't find that... Um, a major element in Washington State blends. You know, this was, uh, even with all of the apparent wood and ripe fruit um, on the nose, uh, right behind it was, you know, the classic Bordelais forest floor, um, you know, dried leaves, uh, dusty earth. I think it, it, it spoke to the old world too uh, clearly to me. And I don't think that, well, I think you can confuse what great Washington State Bordeaux blends for Bordeaux, but I think this, even with its modernity in a good sense, was pulling me more to the old world. Why not Corvina? Um, I don't think, uh, for me, um, it's got um, uh, any of the, the, the thumbprint of um, dried fruit elements, meaning fig, raisin, that style, uh, and that illusion of sweetness that I often get from those wines. Um, Tim, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, absolutely okay. agree. And yeah. also the S is not high enough. And uh, mm -hmm. there's usually, you know, wine with this kind of richness and depth, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's volatility too. Yeah. Uh, good point. And this doesn't show it. Yeah, not at all. Right. Yeah, there's a, and, and if I dare add, and this is not meant to be mean or, or sound mean mm -hmm. or judgmental, there's a, a polish to this wine uh, versus the rusticity that I would associate more with <laughs> Corvina that, that you don't find. And that's not a, a, a hack at Corvina or whatever. It's just a difference in, in personality and style. I know we have to go to the next wine, Li Meng, but you know how Evan said, make sure you give this air. It isn't just mm -hmm. to soften the tannins, but I'm going back to the aromatics have become far more harmonious the longer it sits in my glass. And I find that really thrilling that the wine is sort of going, okay, I'll talk to you in a nice way, you know, even though it's a little too early for me. But I think the harmony also um, uh, speaks to Bordeaux as opposed to, you know, a compelling fruit character. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, now for the final wine, Evan, back to yeah. you. I'll finish this one up. Um, this is a fun wine and, and uh, to, to paraphrase Trim earlier and now for something completely different, this is a big uh, change from, from wine five. Uh, if you're holding it across your, your white paper, uh, the wine has a, you know, the day brightness, all of the, the clear markers there. Um, it's not quite as, as deep and opaque as the wine that Madeline just uh, came off there. And it's definitely more in that ruby vein, but there is sort of a, um, a consistency of, of that ruby to light ruby. Uh, element there, which again, when you don't have as much rim variation across a wine, that's usually to me a bird dog to the wines probably on the more youthful side. Uh, there is a slight staining to the tears, which suggests obviously the um, pigmentation uh, could be varietal, could be fermentation temperatures, could be part of the world that's from, etc. All those things together. Uh, this wine is, is literally a, a, a fruit basket of lots of cool things going on. There, there are definite elements of red fruit there, um, whatever of those that you choose to pick. Um, uh, they're, 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 they're bold. And what's interesting here is there's a, a combination of uh, ripe characters to it. There's some that's sort of more in that kind of like hard candy element. And there's also dried notes to it here. So it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that which uh, partially could speak to the variety uh, and the way the variety ripens. It could simply speak to the wine style, et cetera. A touch of blue fruit here, but, uh, but not so much. And then um, uh, an interesting undercurrent of dark fruit here. It still seems to be, to me, to be showing today a bit more red than it is black, but there is definitely blackberry notes and some fig uh, type characters. There are a little bit of those uh, fig Newton cookies that uh, we used to eat when we were little kids, et cetera. Um, and just a very soft note of stone fruit in there, uh, whether you want to call it kind of that Turkish delighty thing or an apricot custardy sort of thing, a little bit there, but, but again, um, I think for today, at least more on that sort of multifaceted red and, and dark fruit vein. 
a bit of florals. Uh, again, a little bit of, you know, you want to call it hibiscus and rose. I do remember when we tasted this the first time, and I think I was probably the leading vote for lilac, but it is such a pronounced flavor. I'm not finding it so much today. And obviously on the, uh, the fruit side, not anything green on the veggies, but a little bit of beets and beetroots and potatoes and tubers and things like that. Some sun-dried tomatoes, an interesting um, collage of, of herbs uh, that are there. Again, to me, I get a little bit of that basil character today, a little bit of that gariginess, that sort of Provençal herb thing that you might find, which might echo uh, almost like a lavenderish character, which might be someone else's lilac or hibiscus. Uh, some pepperiness and spiciness, definite licorice here. And uh, interestingly, more black licorice than red, although the fruit's more red than it is black. Um, some soft organic earth here, more in that sort of compost rich potting soil uh, sort of stuff here. A little bit of dirt, a little bit of clay terracotta thing, no real inorganic earth to speak of whatsoever. Uh, some pronounced oak, uh, but not what I would call overbearing. The oak is there um, to accent the style of the wine. Feels to me like a combination of quality oak, new and old, um, and whether you want to call it bacon spices, uh, star anise, whatever. A bit of nuttiness uh, coming from that oak as well too. Um, and there's interesting here. I went back and forth because I remember tasting this wine and I always taste the wines again before I go back and look at the grid. I think Madeline said something really important earlier, which is don't try and necessarily fit the, the wine into boxes first. Taste the wine first, enjoy the wine first. Maybe doodle some things on a piece of paper before you go jumping into the grid. And I remember talking with a couple of our subscribers the other week who were talking about, about doing that. And sometimes, you know, there's this tendency to want to get online and start filling out without letting the wine talk to you here. So I did that there and I noticed myself, hmm, there is something kind of volatile there. And my initial thought was sort of volatile acidity. And I thought to myself, because I knew what the wine was, is that appropriate? Is that inappropriate? Um, but I'll explain it more when we get to the wine. It actually makes more sense later on. Um, obviously beyond sort of skin contact to make it a red wine, nothing really perceived choice there. So let's go back and taste it now. And structurally, it's dry, obviously. The acid is, 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 is uh, medium-ish to medium plus. I think one of the telltale signs of this particular varietal as we, we find it is that people oftentimes are surprised and don't necessarily go the way it is. It's, 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 it's literally at that uh, crux, that fulcrum of being just on the medium plus side, I think a medium. Alcohol is, is, is relatively rich in the wine, although not burning by any stretch of the imagination. The tannins are well managed here. They're present, they're, they're intense. There's a good amount of them, a medium plus amount. But as Madeline said before, pay attention to not only the quantity of tannins, but quality here. And here they're quite smooth, they're quite round, they're quite creamy. Find the wine to be um, quite long there and a lot going on uh, mm -hmm. to it. So it's a very interesting wine. There's certainly a lot of flavor here and mm -hmm. um, lots of good choices that we can make from it when we hit the bowl. Yes. Yeah, so um, on this, there's a comment here, is it dry with a ripe attack? I think that there is a perception of sweetness. Is that just ripeness? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point worth bringing up because there is a difference between sweetness and ripeness. And in this particular case, which is sort of um, validated by the generosity of fruit, by the alcohol, et cetera. Remember, alcohol at these levels gives you a perception of sweetness. You know, sort of like when you're dealing with low levels of dairy fat, cream tastes sweeter than milk because the fat does that. Wines that are slightly more alcoholic, even if they're dry, will seem sweeter because alcohol in these percentage points in which we play with wine is by definition a sweet. So um, yes, this wine has sort of a sweet, ripe attack while being from a perception level dry. So that's an excellent point worth bringing up. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna run the poll right now. Your last poll of the day. Oh, and here we go. All right. Be creative. <laughs> <laughs> so you have Malbec, Zinfandel, Rhone blend as your options. I'll give you a minute to do this. Um, and region wise, you have Old World, Italy versus France and New World, Argentina versus California. Again, the emphasis here for those of you who have the wine is what you thought it was. And for those of you who don't have the wine, hopefully there are enough markers here for you to theoretically guess what this wine is. Are there any questions while people are voting, Li Meng, that I should address? 
Um, there are some people who are guessing other as Chianti Classico. I will tell you, and I'll share in just about 20 seconds here, but the leading uh, varietal is coming out to be Zinfandel. And there are lots of people who are interested across the board on Malbec, Rhone, but also Chianti Classico and Amarone, which mm. is another. So I think, Evan, you have a lot to address there. Yeah. Um, what kind of markers are really pulling you one way or the other without revealing it just quite yet? Well, it's interesting. Where, where, where I'm probably leaning least towards the Malbec at this point in time is twofold. Although the generosity and smoothness of tannic structure can certainly suggest that to you. Um, the wine is not, for lack of better words, black enough and dark enough there. Also, you know, literally we call Malbec liquid violets at the time, and there isn't a strong purple, uh, purple floral character there. So I would probably lean away there. Um, Zinfandel, there's all the telltale markers and most of you think that's what it is. Um, for those of you who are leaning in that Tuscan vein, I kind of get it, you know, Tuscans tend to be red fruited. They tend to have that sort of rusticity to them and that um, what we're calling here volatility that I'll explain a little bit more there as part of that. Um, I would say they're generally not quite as generous as this, except in super duper ripe years. Um, the acid level uh, would be as such, if not even a little bit higher, but the weight would be down. And you probably would pick up more mineralic scents than here, whereas the earthiness here tends to be very much of that sort of compost potting soil stuff I use in my yard, or I should say my wife uses in the yard because I don't garden, um, <laughs> but she would use it in her yard, in our yard when we were doing that and not so much of a, of a minerally sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the wine is da, 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 the dash, Zinfandel. Zinfandel. Um, Evan, will you also address a, a bit more on this um, old New World? How? What are the things that are really specifically pulling you to New World here? Yeah, well, a, a couple of thoughts here. I mean, first of all, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, with Mike Dash and his wines, Mike spent years. Uh, driving the Zinfandel program at Ridge before he went off on his own. So he knows his Zins and he makes a myriad different of them. A couple of thoughts here. First of all, the Dry Creek element here. To me, Dry Creek, um, you know, you could literally take a guided tour of, of uh, the state of California through the prism of Zinfandel. I mean, you can start up in the foothills and work your way down, hit the coast of Mendocino, go back inland, go down through rock pile across here, boom, 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 eventually end up in Paso. And the Zinfandels literally change. I actually personally believe, at least in my opinion, that it's probably more reflective of place than any other varietal uh, variety we have in California. And, you know, it's essentially our signature indigenous, if you will, grape, although it's not, it's not ours. What, what always tells me is telling of Dry Creek is that sort of bramble bush, cobbler, mm -hmm. um, brambleberry type character that you have here, sort of like berry liqueurish kind of thing, which screams in this wine and always tends to lean red, a little bit black, but always tends to lean red here. All this has a nice combination. 2017 was a, uh, a big year. If you remember, we had Heavy rains early, then it got hotter than hell, and uh, keeping balance in the wines was uh, down intense, to say the least. Uh, produ production was down a little bit. This does have a little bit of oomph, though, because there's about 10% Petite Syrah blended into it, and it does add a little bit of element of structure, a little bit of element of rigidity at the bottom there, and then obviously it's got fairly rich and, and, and ample alcohol uh, to it. Nice amount of oak there, 20% uh, new, but uh, 14 months in, in quality oak there. Um, Li Meng, you asked me a question and of course I danced there, all the way there, there. there are a couple of questions actually. I'm going to throw them all out at you um, and I keep your answers um, short sure, because I'm sure. going to, I'm going to throw a bunch out. So <laughs> for, for starters, the Zinfandel we got, the New World we got, but how is it different from an Italian Primitivo? Primitivo, I mean, a, a couple of thoughts there. Pri, Primitivo, which is obviously, you know, a genetic, genetic replicate uh, of Zinfandel, tendency, has a tendency to twofold. Number, number one, it's really uh, relegated down to Puglia in the southern part of Italy uh, there. And they tend to be extremely rustic. They rarely see new oak uh, or any oak of quality whatsoever. And this wine, again, to use the sort of polish versus rusticity thing we talked about earlier, that would sort of reflect the difference between Primitivo here. There's a couple of people who actually label their wines Primitivo in California, as several of you know, who not only believe that their, their uh, clonal plant material comes from there, but their interpretation tends to be rustic. What might have given you that sort of rustic Italian thought or, or other parts of the world was this sort of volatility. And here's where I want, I think this is an interesting point and opens 
up, perhaps either an interesting evocative conversation or a can of worms, depending on how you want to, uh, to look at it here. But um, my initial thought was, well, wow, I know Mike and I know these wines and all that. What's, what's going on here? So I went back and I looked it up and this wine is 100% native fermentation. Now, what you're getting here is not so much volatility as you are sort of the, the, the flavors, the eminent resulting flavors that oftentimes come from native ferment, which give you sort of that rusticity, that, 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 that the natural wine thing that you get in other wines, be it orange wines or other wines, or simply in um, wines of, uh, that are made in that style. I was literally brought back immediately to a, a Beaujolais made by a Domaine de Fa, which is the Beaujolais property that uh, Alain Greo owns, which I loved the wine, but when we were tasting it for the grid, I booted it out because I said, it, you know, it's a, I'll take the bottle home and drink it with dinner, but it doesn't really taste exactly like Beaujolais because it tastes more like Pinot Noir and all that sense here. When you're playing with native fermentation, which is increasingly part of the DNA and vernacular of wines these days, be they reds, whites, orange, or whatever, we need to sort of understand how they, they fit into that, because that's gonna add a whole other fourth dimension into wines that are there. And I think for people that ended up at either Primitivo or other places that were more old worldian, Tuscany, et cetera, it was that element more than the nature of the fruit and the nature of the wine style that probably drove them in that direction. Great. Um, Evan, can you also explain why this is not a Syrah dominant wine from a riper vintage in Northern Rhone? Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, it would have to be um, uh, for, for the, you're lacking the sort of the, the pepperiness, you're lacking the bacon, you're lacking the, the, the gaminess, you're lacking all that that you would find in the Rhone. But whether it's that sort of combination bacon fat sort of thing, I'm not finding it here. Certainly in a riper year, that would be played down in deference to darker fruit and all that, but it would still be an underlying element. I can see how somebody could move that way based on the nature of the fruit, based on the generosity of the wine, based on um, the structure here, but it just doesn't, it doesn't have enough Syrah markers to me, certainly to be Northern Rhone. If anything, you could opt out and say, maybe it was somebody's interpretation of a new world style Rhone made that way. And it might be the petite Syrah element that is adding that extra bit of pepperiness or, or game there that's sending it off there. An interesting call. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we are at the end of the uh, six wines. I want to just highlight a couple of things. And then if we have any time left, we'll go back to the one question that we missed. Um, so if you are feeling overwhelmed, like I am, when I have to sit through and listen to these guys talk about wine and go, how little I know, um, please know that you're not alone. I, I hear this from our customers, uh, from you guys all the time. Oh my gosh, I scored really poorly against your grid. Um, there isn't really poorly, you know, keep it fun. Um, over time, you'll get more and more of the lingo. You'll get more and more of how to fill it out. Um, please don't give up. Um, I know that certainly for me, um, in working with Madeline, Tim and Evan, um, every time I taste with them, I learn something. So, uh, keep at it. And, um, and if you want more, please do know that we are looking at, um, we, we do have custom kits, of course, um, but we also are looking at having coaches as well. So um, if you guys are interested in having one-on-one -on -one coaching, this is something that we will launch uh, very quickly. Uh, the next webinar is July 22nd. We are available for orders starting tomorrow. Um, they are going to go fast because Evan and I have a, a thing where um, I am afraid, for those of you who are in retail, of having too much stock. So we buy just enough. We make 120 kits and we ship them all out. And by the third week of shipping, we are all out. So we do not hold a lot of inventory. Um, it's hard for us to go back and ship inventory that we've already shipped. So please know that starting tomorrow, orders can, be, um, can come in. If you are already a subscriber and get annual um, Indiegogo or monthly shipments from us, don't worry. We are tracking to ship webinars with those subscription kits. Um, and thank you so much to Russell, who said that this session was more valuable than the last one. We hope so. We certainly learned <laughs> a lot from doing technology here. 
Um, and we, we are really uh, looking to improve. So again, don't forget to do the survey. Last but not least, um, the weather is getting really hot. I know in my house right now, um, it, it, it's up there, even in Northern California. So there are three things that we're doing. Uh, one is we're adding ice packs if you choose to add ice packs. And you can also upgrade to a two-day air. And we have those prices uh, listed with the product. Uh, or if you're a monthly subscriber, all our sessions are recorded. So Kathy's asking this question about recording. We do record every single session. So you can always don't come to the webinar and taste at your own pace, at, at your own timing when, um, when the wine comes to you so that it, you, know, you can reveal it um, when, when the time is right. Um, if you are a subscriber, just know that the summer shipping options will be mailed out to you so that you can choose, because obviously you've already paid for your ship shipments. Um, we'll give you an option in about five days to reply to us and say, what, which of the three options you wanna do. Um, I wanna say thank you to all our panelists, Evan, uh, Tim and Madeline. Um, thank you so much um, for being here, for, for being a part of this. Uh, we want to tell everybody to stay healthy. I'm going to stop sharing so I can show my screen with everybody in. Um, I could just add so one, much. Can mm -hmm. I just jump in one thing at the very Please. beginning about getting better over time? Remember, the hardest time to do anything is mm -hmm. the first time. It's true of webinars. Hopefully this one was better than the last one. Next one will be better than this one. But also your own tasting skills, your ability to become familiar with the grid, etc. I promise you that um, given the diligence that you have of being here and tasting with us um, and the diligence you have in the process, your scores are going to go up. I can promise you that. Mm -hmm. for, many, for several of you, this might be literally the first kit that you've ever done with us. So um, practice makes perfect. Experience is the best teacher and um, you can always feel free to shoot us uh, questions online we'll be happy and if it, if it feels too geeked out for you um it's meant to be geeky sorry guys you are very super geeky about wine and for those of us who don't have um that level of knowledge and theory it's okay our goal is to bullseye super geeked out and you get what you will and want out of it um i do want to go back since we do have a few minutes to answer natasha's question because it feels kind of bad if we have extra time not to answer her question. Uh, Natasha said, and I think this is going to be a tough one, guys. Uh, we've been taught in training that heavily oaked Napa Sauvignon Blanc is the benchmark. And I'm asking you to go back to wine two, where mm -hmm. do you see more leaner styles from California emerging as a new benchmark? That is the last question I have. Um, I'm going to jump in yeah. since... Uh, since uh, Tim, go. Tim is shaking his head on that. That is not the model. Sorry. Huh? It's not. Heavily Oaks, you know, yeah. California Sauvignon Blanc is not the model, period. It's not. California when there, Sauvignon Blanc with oak is a model, yes. But high quality California Sauvignon yes. Blanc will have a modest amount of oak that will integrate yes. with the rest of the wine as this one did, and it will be true to the varietal which this one was. So that was actually a terrific question. I wanted to segue, since I can hear my voice, to the Zin for a moment, especially for those of you who are feeling overwhelmed with the geeky, uh, you know, uh, uh, too many options in terms of descriptives factor. When a wine confuses me, and actually the Zinfandel, I thought, you know, I'd have a hard time with this, but I always pull back and I'm true to myself and I trust the wine and I think, what is it telling me? That illusion of sweetness, the alcohol, the BA, the verging on overripe, that little stemmy quality to it, what am I describing? And it, and it, and it speaks new world, not old world to me at all, it speaks probably monovarietal, what am I describing? And all of a sudden, I'll consider it because the wine is telling the truth. The wine is not trying to, to, um, to mess you up at all. Great. Well, thank you again, everybody. Thank you for all the great feedback. Um, and I love Mary's uh, comment and I'll end with it, Mary. Biggest takeaway, trust my first instinct, always right. Someone else said it earlier on, don't second guess. And I think that we're so, um, you know, insecure in this world of wine sometimes that we lose ourselves in the mesh of words. Um, the words are not there to scare you. The words are there to give you options. So thank you again very much, guys. And to that, cheers till next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks bye -bye. so much. Bye-bye.